Okay, I think we might start. We'll just wait. Um, as usual, being a volunteer organisation, we've had the normal um, volunteer organisation Zoom glitches. But we've got a fantastic um, panel and discussion tonight, and it will certainly all go up on our YouTube channel. So my name is Dr. Peter Raisbeck, and um, I am part of ACAN Australia, Architects Climate Action Network. Welcome to our custodianship um, panel. Tim, Claire and I are going to get away through it. <laughs> Maybe just wave your hand or so everyone knows. So I'd like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the um, unceded land on the continent on which we work, learn and live. I won't list all the language groups. I generally work on uh, Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong land of the Kulin Nation. And I think we recognise the unique place held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent. With histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. And we also acknowledge their enduring cultural practices of caring for country. And I think in many respects, that is why we are here um, to talk about these issues. And for many of us as privileged architects, we recognise our privilege as colonisers and we also recognise that we cannot speak um, directly for Indigenous um, people. But nonetheless, we think that this is an important issue for architects to begin to look at in depth and to think about how the um, idea or concept of custodianship might change the way that we practice. A general introduction to ACAN Australia. Um, we've kind of, uh, sub, well, mirrored ourselves off um, ACAN UK, but we've got close ties with um, ACAN International and many of the ACAN groups in Europe and including um, other places. I think we also have a connection to ACAN in Nigeria. I think we're different. We like to think we're different. We've only been going this year. This is our second um, online event for the year. I think last year we were really building our infrastructure. Um, we feel that we're different to some of the other groups that are doing um, working in the climate space in architecture and the built environment. Our last event, and we feel that we're different because um, we're non-hierarchical. Anyone can join. We're not bound by traditional norms or um, hierarchies, organisational hierarchies of um, architectural practices. Um, we're also open to other people who may not necessarily other areas of expertise. We believe in transdisciplinarity um, across disciplines and we're keen to see other people come into the group who aren't necessarily architects. And we also like to think that in some ways we're more political. And certainly um, given the guests that we have here today, and in light of our last event, we like to look at things in um, to highlight the uh, complexity in the climate space rather than just simply what I would call virtue signalling. So <clears throat> as the industry grapples with its sizable carbon footprint, custodianship offers an alternative model rooted in circularity, intergenerational equity and environmental stewardship. The panel I hope tonight will explore custodian ships, um, sources of inspiration and potential to drive sustainable transformation in architecture. We've got a number of speakers who are going to be with us. We've got Valentina, Valentina Petrone, is WSP's Australia Circular Economy Lead and combines her architectural background with an in-depth knowledge of circular economy principles and how they could be implemented um, 
to the built environment at different scales of intervention. Notably, she has co-authored the Circular Design Guidelines for the New South Wales Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water to help um, facilitate the transition to a circular built environment. She has also successfully delivered pioneering circular economy projects in Australia with a focus on designing out waste from the outset along with developing a circularity assessment tool to quantify benefits related to circular design strategies. And Tim, I will hand it over to you to introduce Simon. Uh, Michael, uh, I believe. Uh, so have I got that correct? Thumbs, thumbs up, Valentina. Yeah. Michael is a descendant of oh, the- Michael, sorry. Is a descendant of the Yuan people of the Budawong tribe. Michael has a range of specialisations in the broad area of design theory and architecture, including the nature of design and its role towards Aboriginal society, contemporary Indigenous identity, and how this might be formalised through the built environment, and with the relationships between theory and practice in planning society and the city. With best practice forged in the academic environment, Michael applies appropriate engagement and design methodology to achieve contemporary and traditional Aboriginal design outcomes. Welcome, Michael and Valentina. So I'll hand over to you for your short presentation. Thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, I have prepared a few few slides as a bit of an introduction to uh, what is the approach uh, for circular economy in the built environment that at WSP we, um, we offer. And so I'm going to share my screen. You confirm you can see the screen? Yeah. Perfect. So as mentioned, uh, my name is Valentina Petroni. I'm uh, um, the Australia Circular Economy Lead for Australia, and I'm very pleased to be here with uh, Michael, with my colleague, and is a technical executive for the Indigenous Design, Architecture and uh, uh, Knowledge. Um, also, at WSP, of course, we acknowledge that uh, every project we work on takes place on First People lands, and we recognize Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first scientists and engineers, and we pay our respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. Um, so as part of my little introduction, I thought to just uh, provide a brief overview and uh, a bit of a definition around uh, uh, circular economy, um, assuming that uh, most of the attendees will be um, designers and architects, so more relevant to the, the built environment space. But starting from the very basic, I or like to share always this image because to me it's very clear and simple showing that a linear economy where we have a lot of waste generated and very big, big beans is not really sustainable no longer. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are transitioning through a recycling economy, which is absolutely better than just sending uh, waste to landfill, but is not uh, um, truly a circular economy. Ideally, in a circular economy approach, we really want to minimize the amount of waste generated in the first place and have uh, very small and nearly empty bins. And according to the Alan McCartan Foundation, which is the, the leaders in this space in the UK and Europe, uh, we really want to look at the three key principles that are top right on the slide. So design out waste from the outset. And as designers, we have a great power to do so. Then we will try to keep materials in use at the highest value for as long as possible. So as part of recycling, we know that sometimes some materials can be recycled, but they're mostly downcycled and they can be recycled many, many times. So looking at that aspect as well, and uh, ideally regenerating natural systems, which sometimes with uh, built environment materials is a bit of a challenge, but ideally we are trying to uh, restore and regenerate uh, uh, the earth rather than just depleting it. Um, another way to look at the circular economy approach, again, as a, from a designer lens, is uh, looking at uh, a, an expanded uh, uh, waste hierarchy called the, the uh, circularity ladder or the 10 R's. So we are probably all very familiar with the, the original three R's, the reduce, reuse, recycle, which is a great starting point. 
but uh, more recently we've been looking at 10 hours and particularly we want to focus on the top parts of the hierarchy, starting with the refuse, rethink and reduce, where again, as designers, we have a great power to um, challenge the status quo and the business as usual and, uh, and trying to find ways to uh, design in a different way our um, our assets. And as you can see, there are uh, lots of nuances. So we have definitely reuse, repair, refurbish, remanufacture and repurpose are still very valuable initiatives to keep materials in use at the highest value. Recycling, as I mentioned, is still part of a circular economy approach, but in the hierarchy can sit uh, fairly, fairly lower. So it's very important that uh, as uh, designers and professionals, we are aware that recycling is an option, but is not uh, uh, the best option available and we can look at uh, different uh, um, solutions. Another diagram I like to share when I, um, and I, I talk to, to people and particular designers about what a circular built environment could look like is the current uh, diagram where you see the black icons and the black arrows. They're trying to um, showcase a, a business as usual or a conventional design approach where typically we would extract raw materials from our land, uh, manufacture products that we need uh, with uh, using virgin materials. Then we typically apply conventional design strategies, which often don't look beyond the, um, the immediate needs for, for the asset we are designing. And often we don't consider opportunities for future adaptability or future disassembly and reuse. Then during the operational phase of an asset, often minimal maintenance is undertaken for many, many external factors. And once an asset reached the end of their useful life, there is a tendency to demolish it and, and start from, from scratch. And we know that uh, uh, when we demolish an asset, uh, there might be a lot of uh, um, you know, mixed materials source separating and yes we can recycle some materials but a good quantity can get downcycled and some materials end up into landfill when we try to think about a, a circular design approach if we follow the red icons and red arrows it all starts with uh, with good design so as designers again we have the the power thinking back to the 10 hours to rethink the way we are designing our asset and ask some simple questions do we need this uh, uh, component do we need this material can we think about something different that is more um, environmentally friendly and when we design an asset uh, for how many years are we thinking about this asset will be used in this uh, um, with this um, you know, configuration. It might be that if you are designing today a car parking space, in 10 years we might reconvert it into a residential uh, house or a commercial space. So how can we think about the height clearance? And uh, some choices, some design choices sometimes seems uh, simple and easy and uh, that don't have a big impact. But in reality, when we're trying to then undertake an adaptive use of an asset can be a deal breaker. And very important also is a shift in the mindset through the operational phase. So it is uh, definitely important to learn to keep the uh, the quality of, of the envelope and all the different building components uh, in, in good function. And uh, thinking about uh, if we have, uh, for example, a facade of the uh, building services that might require more maintenance and more, uh, more regular replacements. How can we design those uh, connections to those components that we can easily uh, disassemble them and repair and without causing too much uh, trouble to the other layers of an asset that are connected. And in an ideal world, we would like to see that the end phase of uh, any project will become the starting point of a new project. So ideally, if we design um, our assets in the right way, we can facilitate adaptive reuse or deconstruction and using existing assets as uh, a, a bank of materials and really trying to keep those uh, um, resources in, in use as long as possible. As, um, as mentioned at the beginning by Peter, I had the honor to uh, co-author the uh, Circular Design Guidelines for the Built Environment on behalf of the New South Wales State Government. And um, this is uh, the, think the, the most important part of the strategy where we try to link to each of the principles um, a, a series of design strategies just to offer a, a framework as a starting point. 
uh, these strategies, uh, uh, in my opinion, can be uh, amended and uh, um, revised based on the different uh, project needs. Uh, in some projects, we might not be able to apply all these strategies, but I think it gives you a good starting point, uh, starting from the, the first principles of designing out waste. As I said, uh, can we start reusing what we have? Can we design for um, achieving um, extended longevity of components? Uh, can we look at uh, future disassembly and then uh, when we manage uh, existing materials how can we reuse them uh, how can we um, facilitate the disassembly and, uh, and repairability of those assets and looking at uh, the third principle which in the bit environment can be the the most difficult how can we try to regenerate natural system or at least return those components to uh, to system and um, this uh, um, in this framework, um, I think you can see that it is definitely a, a Western uh, perception and the way the, um, the different strategies are named, they reflect what has been uh, um, international reference uh, looking at uh, the, for example, the London city plan, but also in Canada, that is the, the terminology that uh, have been used so far. And that is what has been uh, uh, you know, agreed with the New South Wales state governments, but we, we feel there could be more to that. So I'll pass over to uh, Michael to, to talk to about this slide. Thank you. Yeah, so this sketch to the left is a um, <clears throat> indigenous take on Valentina's lovely diagram on the right, where um, a lot of this is is fairly well understood now. But what we understand from um, Aboriginal Australia is that a lot of this was already there in quite sophisticated ways, um, <clears throat> and so starting at the top, take what you need. Um, that's something I've heard a lot of my Aboriginal elders talk to me about, um, particularly in projects. Um, we, we, we have a desire to design beautiful Aboriginal spaces or contemporary design, or but um, sometimes the elders are like, no, 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 that's not what this site needs. It, so at the top of that is the concept of enoughness, which my sister Danielle talks a, a lot about. Um, and it's quite a philosophical, it's all very philosophical, but partic particularly this idea of how much is enough. Um, and, and that's a very tough thing because I think a lot of individuals struggle with that one uh, in a variety of aspects of their life and then also organisations as well. So, so that in a general idea, I think, can be quite a beautiful thing to, to, to think about. Uh, share country and its resources, very obvious. Aboriginal people were doing that for a long time. And what, one thing I find interesting is how um, in, in many areas you find that areas were carefully managed with resources and um, making sure that there was enough of those. So, And then allowing access to those resources as well. With also, particularly in Sydney, there was a lot of um, sharing going on um, help others, very obvious, that one. Um, I'll just sort of pick up on some of the obvious ones. Uh, plan for the future, so that's when moving into tread lightly, and this is something that I think everyone can understand is an Indigenous value, not just in architecture, um, but also uh, healing, caring for country as well, which I think th this topic is is primarily about when it's talking about Indigenous. Um using materials of country so this gets back to that desire to to bring in materials from elsewhere but actually a lot of the elders are saying don't do that you're going to destroy a country over there to make this this spot better that's inappropriate which really stumps a lot of teams because they're like oh we can get this beautiful marble from italy or we can get this um granite from down south and and no so does that mean we need to temper our expectations with design? In some projects, yes, we're, we're not going to get that potential high quality material. But um, I think there's still some ways we can do that and also make it sustainable and make it um, look good too. Then moving into put it back when you're done, which I really like because this one is, is it, 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 when I was young, it blew my mind that some Aboriginal people 
didn't have this concept of ownership that I think a lot of people you see today do and consumption, consumer consumption. Um, objects were, were often thought of to be borrowed forever. So, I don't, you know, you, you, you come across countless examples, um, particularly where colonists have written down where Aboriginal people have borrowed something or and it was caused a lot of conflict, but actually... For, for the Aboriginal people, it was like, what are you, what are you worried about? So as, a, as a frame of mind, put it back when you're done is very, you know, we're all going to go back to the earth um, or, in, or or up into the sky. Um, I think that's something that we all need to think about. But from an organisational perspective, it starts to get much more interesting because I think we... So rethinking ownership and then leave country better than what it was before, which I think is encapsulates perfectly what, what we want to do here. Um, country is a thing. It, it's a living entity, and each site is different, down to 10 metres, down to hundreds of metres, kilometres, understanding what that country wants to be and then how, at least in my projects as an architect and whatnot, but also everyone else in whatever discipline you're thinking of, how can we leave this particular bit of country better than what it was before, which I think is quite nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll leave the floor to the others. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Thank, thank you, Michael. Michael.